Good evening and welcome to the new school, to the third event in our series, Dining and Design, um, that we launched together with the James Beer Foundation. My name is Fabio Parasecoli, and I'm the coordinator of the Food Studies program here at the new school. We started this program in 2008, and now it's developed in a full-on program with classes that go from history to media, communication, policy, nutrition. We have a growing number of students, and if you're interested, all of our courses are also open to the general public. This is part of the history of the new school, and we uh, try to continue that, and it's a very interesting uh, experiment. Uh, we're also trying to work more closely with the culinary arts, so we've created uh, an agreement with the International Culinary Center, so our students can go on mobility and get their diploma as chefs while getting their BA or BS here at the new school. And people that have a diploma chef from the ICC can come to us and finish uh, their college education. So we're working in, in many ways to make you know, the connection between academia and the outside world more, more interesting and, and stimulating. Uh, one last thing, we have um, a website called The Inquisitive Eater. You're all welcome to uh, not only uh, check it out, but also to submit uh, pieces, photos, design. We want it to be an open space where everybody can participate uh, in the conversations. So uh, we also have a series of events. These are about designs. Next fall we'll have some about art. We'll have one about food and climate change. Um, if you're interested, just leave your name at the entrance. We'll make sure to send uh, announcements uh, about the, the following and the next, uh, next event. The closest one will be on June 19th, and it's going to be about coffee and caffeinated drinks. Um, you're more than welcome. And on July 17th, we're organizing a meeting with all the mayoral um, candidates to talk about what they think uh, will be the role of food in the future of New York City. So that's going to be quite interesting. All right, so I would like to introduce Mitchell Davis, who will moderate the panel. Mitchell is the vice president of the James Beer Foundation. Um, is also the communication uh, guru. <laughs> <laughs> at the James Beer Foundation. We'll see if anyone understands anything at the end of the evening, and then we'll let you know about that. <laughs> Thanks. We've worked together several times, uh, and uh, we're very happy to work uh, with him and the James Beer Foundation. Here we have uh, also the architects that are behind this idea. Maybe Mitchell will, will say more about that. And we're also very happy to welcome uh, David Chang and his partner, Andrew Salmon, and the designer Anwar uh, Mikhaich, and I will let Mitchell to Sure. Thank you, Fabio. And thank you for um, hosting us. <laughs> but before we get into the meat of the conversation, I'll give a little bit of background about these talks. This is the last of a series of three. Um, conversations called Dining and Design. Um, and then we'll, we'll have our conversation, which is less perhaps of a panel and more like a conversation between three people who've worked very closely together. I'm just an interloper, um, but have watched their work and, and experienced um, their work over the years. And then we'll take some time for questions. So if you have any questions, we'll probably have 15 minutes at the end. Um, I should remind you also that this is being taped and will be available on the website that Fabio mentioned, The Inquisitive Eater, um, and um, where you will also find uh, videos of the two previous conversations. And so at the James Beard Foundation, every year in May, you might have heard of the James Beard Awards. We give out a lot of awards for chefs and restaurateurs and for cookbook authors and for uh, broadcast food personalities and, and food journalists and all sorts of stuff, and also uh, for restaurant design. And our restaurant design awards committee, of which two former members are with us in the audience, as Fabio mentioned, James Bieber and Peter Guzzi, who are um, architects and who have uh, been 
part of the restaurant design community of New York and of, of the world um, for many years, thought that it would be nice if we could bring um, the two well, the many parts of the conversation about the design of restaurants, but also the chefs and the food of restaurants together in this series. And it seemed like a very natural place to do it here at the New School, which is home to Fabio's wonderful food studies department, as well as Parsons School of Design, and, and is also so um, such a fixture in, in downtown New York, where we're located just down the street. West 12th Street. And so we started a few weeks ago um, leading up to the awards with a conversation um, between Peter Guzzi himself and Dan Barber and Laureen Barber uh, about Blue Hill, um, the restaurants that they worked on together. Uh, we followed that up with a conversation that Fabio moderated with Andrew Carmelini and the, the design husband and wife team behind Roman and Williams who designed the Dutch and Lafayette. And we're concluding today, thank you all for coming out in the rain to, for this conclusion, uh, with a uh, uh, what I, I'm sure is going to be a fascinating conversation uh, with David Chang, as Fabio mentioned, sitting to my left, who needs no introduction, probably. You could walk, you could throw a stone at three of his incredibly popular and delicious restaurants, uh, Sam Bar, Noodle Bar, and Mamafuku Co. Uh, but also, what we're going to be talking about um, is specifically his four enterprises in um, Toronto. Those are an, another noodle bar, uh, a restaurant called uh, Daisho, a cocktail bar called Nikai, and a Mamofuku Ko-esque tasting menu experience called Shoto. And uh, one thing I will say in, uh, by way of introduction of Dave is that when I asked him to do this um, talk, he said no. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, you know, we don't have any design in our, you know, at some of these restaurants. And we'll talk about that because, of course, the architects thought that was a great answer. Um, and because, of course, there is no place that is not designed. And when you see the images of the Toronto restaurant, you'll understand why we're going to start the conversation there. But I hope it doesn't stop there. Next him is Drew Salmon, who is, uh, told me earlier today he doesn't come out to these things either, ever. So you, you have a, a double feature of people who don't want to be here, uh, <laughs> but for whom I think we're going to, for that reason, get even, even better conversation going. Uh, Drew is a partner in all of the restaurants of the Momofuku Empire um, and um, an integral part behind the scenes. And finally, on the left, Anwar Mikhayic, who is the co-founder of the Design Agency, which is a Toronto-based design firm. Um, and um, I particularly enjoyed talking to him when we first met in Toronto, which is, happens to be my hometown, um, because he and his family also operated one of our favorite restaurants growing up, the Kensington Kitchen. And in fact, Anwar ca came to the design world through restaurants, which I think makes for a particularly interesting uh, piece of this conversation. That's, that's the, that, those are the folks. And before we uh, get into the actual chatter, I'm going to show you some images of the restaurants we're talking about. Because me, who here has been to a Mamafuku in New York? Lots of you. Good. Those who haven't need to go. After this, maybe. Go wait online or put your name on. Someone here can take your name. Um, <laughs> and has anyone been to the restaurants in Toronto here? Oh, yes, one person. OK, so t come with me to Toronto. Um, this is a schematic, obviously. There's four restaurants contained in this, in, um, in this space, which is kind of a glass cube stuck, stuck onto the side of a hotel, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. Um, the Shangri-La Hotel. Um, let's go to the next slide. There's the cube. Not exactly what you think of when you think of that original noodle bar with the plywood stools and whatever, but we'll talk about that. Next slide, please. This is the ground floor, which is the noodle bar in Toronto. Uh, that staircase leads up to a mezzanine. Next slide. This is that mezzanine. This is the cock this is uh, Nikai. Here is Daisho, which is a restaurant that's uh, let's go back a sec. Sorry, that's uh, that's um, it's like a large format. Yeah. It's family style and, eating. Yes, we're, we're, it's a work in progress in terms of what it actually is, just like all of our restaurants, but. Okay. Uh, yes, large. But so the idea, if you've ever been to Mama Fuku Ko and seen the giant bosom or the, the, some of the fried chicken at the noodle bar. So this, I, the idea was that this is a large format eating experience. And then the top of that box is, is this beautiful tasting counter called Shoto. 24 seats? Yes. 24 <laughs> seats. 
Okay, and then just to give you an idea of some of the food we're talking about, um, again, you'll be famous. I, looking at it makes me salivate because I want those chewy, delicious rice cakes. You want to tell us what we're looking at? That was a uh, roasted rice cakes. Um, I actually think they're a little bit better up there because of, we have a Korean guy making them, and, and, and uh, okay. Sam Gelman, the chef of the whole thing, over is over there, and they're just fantastic. They're just much chewier and denser. <laughs> in Toronto. Yeah, in Toronto. So you got to go to Toronto to get the the best rice cake. But things are different. People understand like water is hugely important. Oh. <laughs> you know, we're all sort of made up majority of water, and if water is different, food tastes different. So, wow. um, this is a chicken and egg, uh -huh. a smoked chicken breast. This is the momofuku ramen, which we've all had to change because we can't get Benton's bacon in Canada. Oh. So we've had to figure out how to uh, all of every, even though it's noodle bar name, and everything is sort of much similar, it tastes very different. Mm -hmm. That's the kimchi stew. That's the ginger scallion. Okay. And there we've got some pickles and kimchi. Yep. And a busy, lively noodle bar Toronto. So we're going to hold on that slide and just imagine all of those wonderful things we just saw. And I want to ask Dave, just for right off, what role do you think design plays in the restaurant, in your restaurants? Um, originally, when we opened up Momofuku Noodle Bar, in 2004, um, design was the last thing <laughs> I was concerned about. Uh, if you walk into Co today, uh, it's a bit of a, it's pretty much the same guts of uh, the existing restaurant, uh, which was 600 square feet, got 27 seats on stools from this web company, I can't remember what, but um, I didn't want an open kitchen. Mm. Um, I, if, if, if I could have afforded uh, a decor, we would have. <laughs> so everything in the existing restaurant from the get-go was by default from what we could afford, which was nothing. And that's why there is no decor as we know it. Do you know how much you spent? Uh, originally, it, the whole construction cost uh, just under one hundred twenty, so no, $127,000. Wow. Um, and that's literally for a plywood box. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> the walls were plywood. The walls are still the same. Uh, the chairs, we had to continue to change because they would break all the time. <laughs> um, and the bar was made of plywood. Um, the floors were bamboo. And um, I had worked with uh, Hiro Suruta, who is this you know, great, and Sui Fua, uh, two guys that um, were wonderful in helping build something from scratch on a limited budget. Um, but Open Kitchen was not what I wanted. That was just by, again, accident um, and not having anything. So it just sort of reflected what we were going to do, that it was only going to be about the food. And that's that was the sort of genesis of how we did everything going forward. It was like, oh, I guess this works. We don't have to worry about flowers. Like I remember like running over to Grammarcy Tavern a bunch when I worked at Kraft to use like bandsaw or something. And I'd always walk by, and I think to still to this day, if you walk down, there's this massive floral room. And like I heard something like they spend like half a million dollars a year on flowers. And if you go to Grammarcy Tavern, it's beautiful. You know, the flower arrangements are particularly beautiful. I always notice them. And I was like, I'm so glad I don't have to waste money on flowers. <laughs> and I think Momofugo Noodle Bar became an exercise in what we don't need. And... I don't know if that was, again, I think by accident from just starting. So you work with what you have and you build from there. Okay. So I, that begs a question, I think, for Anwar. Ha, ha, tell us a little bit about the Toronto, pro the scope of scale of the Toronto project. Well, I think uh, maybe if you go back to the slide that shows the, the sketch, that's the best way to sort of really understand where we started and what we were given. I mean, it was... It was an interesting assignment in the sense that there was this raw space split amongst three floors that was not, you know, meant necessarily to be conducive to a, a restaurant of this magnitude. So um, I think I think organically and ironically, it actually fit sort of uh, Dave and Drew's concepts and the, and, the, and the way that they that they explored uh, food and the, and the way that their restaurants kind of stacked up. So. Um, what you can see on the bottom there was really, um, actually, if, if we go to the slide that shows the outside, you can really see that we adopted and, and inherited what they call the ice cube. 
So that's from the architect Dave Cheng from uh, Vancouver. And uh, the statue there. Really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> C-H-E-N-G. That's who we had meant to bring here. <laughs> <laughs> So he, he designed this, though, about 10 years ago. Um, so we adopted this, and actually the Art Gallery of Ontario commissioned a competition for that sculpture out front there, which is um, the artist's name is Juan Juan from Shanghai, and, and that's called The Rising, and it's in this, this incredible um, tree-like vine or structure with all these thousands of birds that uh, kind of attack the, the cube. So that's what we were given to start with, and it was really challenging to just sort of figure out how a space of this sort of grandiose magnitude can then play home to these really raw and sensible and down to earth concepts like noodle and psalm. Um, so we really, you know, there's, there's a little bit, I think of each, what we tried to do is that there's a little beach, a, a little bit of each from, you know, Ko and Ma Pesh and, and we worked really closely with Drew to, to to figure out sort of how everything would fit in there and and how the kitchens would lay out and I, I mean there's a lot to talk about in there. So, what was the what was the budget for that project? <laughs> what, whatever it was, we exceeded it. <laughs> yeah. Ballpark, by a it's lot. more than 120 or less. Def <laughs> yeah, a little bit more, a little bit more. I mean, it was a partnership with the developer as well, so there was a lot of moving parts. I mean, we came into the mix. We were wor actually working on the penthouses of the Shangri-La, because the Shangri-La Hotel is off to the side there, so um, there was a lot of different moving parts because this came together while they were constructing the building. I think it was originally supposed to be an Apple store. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they didn't tell us. If, if you can imagine our, our Peach logo right in the middle of that wooden box there. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's imagine people coming in and demanding <laughs> iPads. <laughs> We're going to put that up, though, right? I, We're going to do that. I, I ramen, yeah. OK, so let, let's go back to the first noodle bar then. And let's talk about the, f the relationship between the food and that environment, and whether or not the open kitchen, the, the let's try it, let's just do it anyway, sort of reflected in your mind what you were doing in the kitchen. I mean, how do, how do the two things come together? Well, the, the, we were very fortunate in the sense that um, when the building was built uh, by the developers, they didn't have anybody in mind. But, I, you know, because you guys are in construction or architecture, you might know that you have to sort of create sort of seems like plans that you're never going to really do to get the, the ball rolling. And uh, when we got there and we saw the plans, they had already built out the, 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 the base of it all. Was there, you know, like with an idea that yeah. this whole space was going to sit around 300 people and feed everyone out of one kitchen. And then we got to see the place, I was like, this is impossible. You, you cannot feed people over three floors out of one kitchen. And I believe that kitchen was going to come out of the first floor, and the third floor was going to serve as banquets for the whole hotel. And um, um, uh, I think Sam and I were recently commenting just how small the banquet kitchen is at the hotel right now because <laughs> um, I refused to be part of it if I had to cook hotel food for the hotel. Um, not that I didn't want to. I, I want to... If we can't do it well, I don't want to do it. And it's it's just cooking banquet food and making food for weddings and bar mitzvahs. It's a lucrative business, but it's not something that I want to burden my cooks with because it's it's um, it's it's satisfying for some and satisfying not so much for others. So uh, we decided that if we were going to go forward, that we needed to sort of have a separation of church and state, which Drew was instrumental in helping. Um, and uh, so we got this raw space and we were trying to, once once they, they, they agreed that we could have the space as ours, we came up with a crazy idea that, I mean, well, I. I <laughs> it, was, it was kind of the, this sort of best case, worst case scenario where since we're working with the developer who is gonna be spending all the money and doing all the work to build out the space, the more we started talking about how the space could be configured and the different concepts that we thought that we could put in there and that the more he became familiar with us the more our sort of collective enthusiasm sort of you know rose 
and we ultimately ended up agreeing to do i think probably more than we sh had intended to do initially let's I'll say it that way the uh it's, there's, an, there's an awful lot going on in that one little box that wasn't purpose built for us. And what you don't see also is the basement, which is a yeah. commissary for. So it's actually, it's a massive project. Right. But it, with each, yeah. with each, with each successive, like when the when when the owner of West Bank, <clears throat> Ian Gillespie, when he decided that that the, basically everything we said he wanted to do, then. It's like it's great for him to say that, but the hotel, like Dave was saying, was already largely designed. So then it was a big battle to try to claw back space, and so we literally were taking portions of the parking garage <laughs> and getting into arguments. With, I mean, I can remember getting into a really enthusiastic discussion with <laughs> the the guy who was running the resident the condominium portion of it and he was like you're taking you know 10 of my parking spaces this is ridiculous we can't sell you know res you know and i say well we we can't make all the food for all these people without a with that something without a kitchen so the whole space is enormous yeah there's a whole other floor there that you're not even seeing but i think a lot of it is just sort of functionality too so um we knew that we were wanted to toy around with uh expanding the concept of noodle bar which we've been allergic and resistant to for years uh, but if we were going to do it, it was going to be a different version of it. It was not going to be tied to what we're doing in New York. And that was going to have more foot traffic. So by default, again, we couldn't put it on the top floor right. and have people travel just to get there. So uh, I always remember, I was just thinking of like that Bruce Lee movie, like where he has to fight Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at the very top of the floor. <laughs> um, that... If you're going to get to the top, then it was you were going to get rewarded by something that was a little bit different. And if you're going to walk all those stairs, like okay, like I get it. Right. Um, it's only three flights, but uh, up and down all day, it's 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 troublesome. But the first floor, uh, that's what we had envisioned that it was going to be uh, our more the most casual of spots. And the second floor didn't really have access to a kitchen, so it was again. Um, uh, actually, it was going to be a private dining room. Well, yeah, it was, oh, yeah, it was three PDRs, and then and we created the most insane private dining room of all time. It was and then really <laughs> an engineering marvel. I mean, it was amazing, and it, the whole thing ended up getting trashed right at the very end of the process because it turned out to be a structural support beam that uh, that the engineers said they couldn't move for the duct work. That was so. a pretty but, big beam. What do engineers know? <laughs> but we had a lot. <laughs> it was a pretty big beam. Yeah, we had a lot of success with Australia in terms of having. Um, we have a restaurant in, in Australia, in Sydney, um, and it's pretty much like tw 2,500 square feet, and 1,800 of it is like kitchen. And wow. somehow we wow. um, we have figured out a way to like make curtains move, or like it's mm -hmm. you know a very Asian aesthetic of having like sort of paper walls, so give give it some separation, um, and that was taken to the to the you know. The, the highest order here in, in Canada. So we were going to have separate rooms with your own stove because, you know, it's it's much more personal if you can do a private dining experience where they're cooking the food for you right there. Right. Um, but because of budgetary constraints, we just scrapped the whole thing. And then Anwar or Drew, 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 had, Drew basically led the charge on most things. So my whole role in this is pretty much going to stop after I talk right now because <laughs> all I ever do is say like, yeah, we should do this. Okay, great. And then I know I don't come back for a while. And that's pretty much before what Before you go away, though, I want you to talk about, um, I want you to talk about, you know, thinking about putting the menus in these places, thinking about the food that you're going to serve in this place that is not a plywood box. Um, and obviously your cooking had changed and evolved from the, the first Psalms you opened in Samba or whatever. But like, did you have an idea of what the food was going to be or were you working sort of in tandem with what the space was to figure out what the food was going to be? No idea. No idea. <laughs> Good. We had no idea. Really, we had no idea. So you and just I can think about that because Noodle Bar, we sort of had an idea. Second floor, we had zero idea because, the, I mean, just friends and family, everything changes. You should have an idea if you're going to open up friends and family, where it's just basically like the test run period where you're not charging anybody. Um, and then Daisho, like a week before we opened, we changed the format completely. So that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay. that was, an, and then Chota was pretty much the only one where we sort of knew, but we didn't really know exactly what the hell we were going to serve. Other than I had Mitch Bates, who was a chef de cuisine at Co. that was going to be there. Mm. And 
you know, I just remember, like, I was praying to God that Sam Gelman wouldn't keel over and die from the stress. And all of us, it was by far and away the, the hardest restaurant opening I've ever been associated with because it was hellish in the sense that opening one restaurant is, is you know, one of the worst experiences you can ever go through. And then every week you were like, oh my God, we're opening another restaurant, basically. <laughs> and um, it was... Oh. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I spent four. I, I, and before we came on, Anwar was like, "Hey, did you eat anywhere in Toronto?" And I was like, "You know what? I, I really have no idea what's going on in Toronto right now, um, because whenever I'm there, I spent pretty much four months there, but I've never really left the building." Right. Yeah, we ate a little bit when you first came. We had some crazy dinners, yes. and that was about it. That was, but right. that was before sort of the hell started, right? So, yeah. so Anwar, talk to me about understanding what Dave had done here and trying to make that work in this puzzle of a cube. Well, we did. I mean, we I, I did spend a lot of time down here in New York, um, you know, experiencing the different concepts and just sort of seeing what I could take away from sort of what was the driving motivation behind these different concepts. Because obviously, you know, there was a huge um, difference in terms of even just, you know, we kind of knew price point. Like Dave said, there was no there was really no discussion about service or food or, you know, we knew that certain spaces had to operate, but I kind of saw that there was this sense of uh, kind of progression throughout the team um, at Momofuku that this kind of, you know, is, is this culture of people working together and working their way up through these different concepts. And that sort of led as well to the the stacking of these ideas. And, and we put the, the Shoto, we had pitched um, the first presentation we did to Ian Glassbee and Drew, and it, we, we had sort of, centered uh, everything around this culmination of events and excitement and, and uh, energy that flows up to Shoto. And then Noodle Bar was you know, loosely uh, based on a bowl of ramen. We were kind of interpreting <laughs> this, this movement of the noodles and the swirling. And, and I, we saw that a little bit in Noodle, just with the, the, the strands of the wood. And so that kind of evolved into this. Uh, at one point, Drew, right, we had, a, we had a ladder that was going up from there were some crazy ideas there, but it was all about it. It actually matched with the sculpture that was out front too, the rising. So it was all about sort of this, you know, how you flow through the space. You know, Nikai, like Dave said, was always supposed to be this really, you know, just a flex space that could be adaptable. It was going to be a cool bar. There was like, you know, at one point we were talking about noodle machines. Um, you know, it's we threw kind of all the ideas uh, at everything. Um, what, what you don't see in the the interior shot of uh, of Daisho is really the the majestic nature of sitting in that dining room um, in downtown Toronto in this glass cube with 40, you know, this is unfortunately going the other direction, it's just looking at the bar, but if you look back the other way, you're sitting in a, in a three-sided glass box with 40-foot high ceilings, um, and actually the wood cube um, houses a swimming pool for the, uh, for the hotel. So there was a lot of really interesting design challenges. Um, so it, we, it, it doesn't really capture, um, right? Like if this yeah. was on Park Avenue or like Fifth mm -hmm. in Midtown, if you could imagine, that's sort of the avenue in terms of where Toronto is at, where it's like the main, probably the only real true avenue in Toronto, where it's like that one way, like, right? Mm -hmm. And coming downtown, and it's really beautiful. Yeah. And if it was, I was joking because we we just did an event last Thursday, and it was like if this was in Midtown, we would be booked solid all the time for private events because of the the beautiful. It just get, it gets so much light, and what's more beautiful is at night. I think at night. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, lighting was key too because it's hard to to light a glass cube. And but there's you're right. There's a bend in the avenue. Yeah. And you can see all the way up Toronto, and it's 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 the biggest. Uh, Which was avenue. crazy for us because we never have any 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 sunlight in any, any of our restaurants. restaurants. And I I just it's a lot of I didn't understand what was going on. I was like, it's so bright in here. <laughs> all the cooks are just staring out the windows. It was a problem. It was yeah. a real problem. And that, that's why Shoto ends up kind of tucked in there. You can see behind the bar. So the Shoto was, was meant to be this kind of like this black cube or this this coal, almost this semi-precious design element. That's why we switched from everything's white oak and concrete. And then when you get to Shoto, it's all, uh, you know, reflective, black, clean surfaces. It's about the 24 seats around the bar. It's about, you know, there's nothing meant to sort of detract um, away from sort of what you're there to experience. So 
it's the black cube holding up this wood cube that's sort of within this glass cube. So it was, it, you can see it in the sketch again that we did. We kind of exploded the sketch and then Drew came up with the idea of the, the map. We actually have this map in the, we have this etched on some of the, by the elevators so you can actually figure out where you are and how to get around because it's a bit like a- This is the indication the, of the, the shopping mall. The sophistication of my design. <laughs> I was like, Anwar, we should make it like a mall. Like put a little mark that says you are here because yeah. it's confusing about where it is. And he did it, only he made it look cooler. <laughs> So that's it look a lot cooler. So, that's but there are a lot of things that we wanted to do that didn't happen. Like Drew and I were convinced that we were going to do the first floor completely automated, um, and Still I just I'm, I mean I thought automated for the like Jetson animation. style. Well, and I just was obviously on another planet in jet jet lag or something because I thought it was possible. Um, <laughs> I heard I heard it's hap happening though. No, no, we're gonna we're still working on it. <laughs> it's a, I think part of the, I think part of the interesting thing about this restaurant and how it evolved within our company was that we had just come off of the 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 Sydney restaurant and that was the first restaurant we ever had the opportunity to build from from the ground up. Um, that's a, for us that's a massive statement and people always ask why'd you do Toronto it's like uh, we were given whatever really we wanted to do which is massive and Sydney was the same thing yeah and Sydney was the first one the first space that we occupied that wasn't supposed to be something else mm. and so like every other space that we have now was in its previous lifetime something else and we had to kind of you know you know get a bunch of custom equipment or like just fit things in spaces that were that that shouldn't be but in Sydney it was just a, a, a rectangle and we could do whatever we want. So there were, there were boxes everywhere and they were just like, hey guys, we'd really like you to open a restaurant. It's completely empty. You can open up anywhere you want to in this whole, you know, 100,000 square foot space. And, and so like, oh, we just okay. picked this box and then we're able to design from it. And, and everything, every idea that I had for how the space should be laid out worked because there wasn't any, there weren't any like, you know, there wasn't like a column in the way or there wasn't something. And so I thought after that, I was like, I know what I'm doing. I can do, like, now I got this. Like, I finally got this. And I get to Toronto. I was like, oh, yeah, sure. We could do it. We could do a noodle bar and a bar and then another restaurant and then a, another and four one. Four kitchens. And, and then, yeah, we, we'll figure out coat check later. <laughs> you need coats in Toronto. It's Toronto. Well, that's, right. oh, yeah. that's why it's called the coats. ice cube. A yeah. lot of things I didn't anticipate for. One is people complain how cold it is here. It's... It's really cold in Toronto, <laughs> and people do wear their coats a lot more than they do in New York. And these are things that I constantly. There's two things I always forget: trash cans, where to where to put out what put trash cans in a kitchen. It's never enough hand sinks, and lastly, are your coats because I I just don't think I always forget what people want in terms of that. <laughs> you know, coats coat check just always miss it on that one so um that's never that's not drew's fault or anyone else's fault because i'm always like no don't we could use that space for something else <laughs> so, so uh, you're, you're mentioning something now that you have a restaurant you have restaurants in new york you have restaurants in australia a restaurant in australia and in toronto how does the place how does that location change the look the food besides the coat issue um where ba bathrooms too i always mess that up bathrooms you don't put them in oh well what happened was in in sydney um, it was a wine wine room or a bathroom. <laughs> the it was very it, similar for right, uh, very right. simple for me because I was like, well, we're, we are in a casino and you have no idea where if you're into our, our, you can't even find our restaurant in the casino. We will intentionally did it that way, but uh, I was like, well, we don't need a bathroom because it's down the hall. So, you know, I didn't right. see what the the big deal was. And then after we opened up, people were like, we don't want it. The bathroom's too far away. So people now have to go through our kitchen and use the employee bathroom. Yeah, he was adamant about not needing the bathroom. Because <laughs> I just the, didn't think it was needed. At the very end, I, I <laughs> snuck one in the back where I, where I figured no one would really notice. And it's like way wedged in the back of the restaurant, but at least it's there. And I thought, well, you know, if people don't want to go walking down the hallway, then at least we'll have it. The thing that I didn't really think of was that not only do you have to walk through the kitchen, but you have to walk past the 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 dish pit. It's, da it's dangerous. So it's dangerous. It's yeah. like there's a dude spraying scalding hot water and you know there's a bunch of grates on the floor where water is draining in and there are people in high heels kind of trying to get back into the it's imagine the scene from Goodfellas where the guy is walking through the kitchen and it's nothing like that. <laughs> so but Toronto has bathrooms I presume. 
Uh, well, on the second floor. Only, yeah, only, <laughs> only two. So that's that's another thing where probably could use. To you can go to the hotel. And, yeah. but, but so, but is there something different from what you're doing there? I mean, in the cooking, in the thinking about it, or is it just an evolution in, because you've done it now four or five, six, eight times? Or, or you really just... I, I think the space really is conducive to what we can do. And Co, for instance, we moved Co originally, not because, I mean, we moved Noodle Bar, not because we wanted to move Noodle Bar, but because it was, the space was literally falling apart. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have enough hot water. We didn't have enough gas, not enough electricity. Uh, in the summertime, I always dread when summer happens because we don't have enough electricity. It's so small that the AC gets sucked out by the HVAC because it's where the guest sits and where the, the hood is. It's, it's never, it's always too cold in the winter because we don't have, we didn't have enough money nor enough roof space to put a heater in. So if it's cold and co, it's because we don't have a heater. Um, <laughs> in the summertime, it's too hot because we don't have enough air condition and we don't have enough power to put bigger units on because right. we're limited in terms of the, the, the electricity we can actually get. Um, and we don't have enough hot water. Um, all these things have held you back. Yeah. Or, or money. <laughs> money. Um, right. So we moved Noodle Bar because we, we calculated and we can answer co on that end because we were like, well, we need to do, we only have this much hot water for this many people. So we only have, we can only cook for like 35 people max mm -hmm. per day. How, how do we make food for 35 people a day, still pay our rent and make it a successful restaurant? Hopefully. And the space dictated what we were going to cook. And Noodle Bar, again, that was the reason why we moved Noodle Bar. And if we had an idea of what we were cooking, in retrospect, now thinking about it, we moved from 27 seats to 77 seats, and we, didn't, we just switched overnight. We didn't, we didn't really, um, we don't ever think about how the space dictates the food. Right. In reality, the space dictates the food all the time. Um, right. And that was, again, a very hard day. Because <laughs> the really, first day there, we, we just thought we're right. very cocky. We just thought we could open up and not have a problem. But it was like, oh my God, we just did like, you know, eight eight hundred people, and we're out of food. This is really tar This is really hard. And right. and Sambar wasn't an, again an accident, as Mitchell knows. It was like supposed to be this burrito bar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. Yeah. And, and, and the funny thing is, though, in terms of the space and design, like I had no idea just how much, you know, we're, we're very fortunate that we get to work with Anwar and, and real architects now, because for a while, not that Hero wasn't an architect, but, you know, when you have a budget, you can do more things. And that was really something that I took for granted. Even when we got money, it was hard. Um, but, you know, um, it's funny just to see how influential certain restaurant designs are. And when Noodle Bar opened up, I had no idea that it looked like anything else. I just thought it was a wooden box. Uh, people were like, oh, it's, it's so minimal. It's so Japanese and aesthetic. I was like, no, it's right. just a box. Right. <laughs> um, some nails and some plywood. And Sambar, mm. uh, after the design was done, I had no idea that when I went to Blackbird and Thomas Schlesher had designed Blackbird, I was like, wow, this is a really nice version of our restaurant. And I was like, wait a second, this restaurant existed right. way before our restaurant. Um, and then we got to hire Thomas to help out on, on Ma Pesh, but we gave him like no budget to work with. So um, it, was, it was fun to work with Anwar <laughs> with a budget and to basically do things that we would never get a chance to do because we would never have wasted our time talking about. We spent hours and hours talking about how to make this private dining room work, mm. which, yeah, never, which happened. Nah, never happened. But I, I think it's, that's a, in answer to your question about how design has sort of evolved from space to space. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain elements that, there are certain th mistakes that we consistently make. Like the first day that it really got cold in Toronto and there w it really isn't any place for anybody to put coats. I thought, man, that, well, that, I really, that was really a mistake. <laughs> but then there are other things that we are getting kind of a hold of now. Like um, in the restaurant in Sydney, we, d we designed these wine, cabinets that sort of or refrigerated cabinets that have glass on both sides so it allows the diner to either look in at at either wine or produce or different uh elements of their meal uh being stored and it kind of separates two spaces out so even though shoto and daisho exist in the same uh on the same floor they're still both separated but but they're separated by functioning 
you know, working pieces of equipment. So it's there, there, there is very little about any of our spaces that that puts, you know, form before function. Yeah, I mean, we literally used every square meter of that space. I mean, the I guess the the coat closet became the the vending machines or the ticket machines, and there's coat hooks somewhere, right? And yeah, we, we lost we lost a lot of space. Just that there was just no no storage anywhere. So it was a real, I mean, it's the space is still evolving too. Like we've changed, you know, we've changed, uh, I think ask sort of ask your concepts change too. And ask the menus change. Like we've been, Nikai has changed, uh, some of the, we've changed table heights and different things. So it's a bit of an organic mm -hmm. work in progress. I mean, you never, in my experience anyways, designing restaurants for uh, 15 years now, it's, I mean, you never, it's not like turnkey, that whole concept of turnkey, you move in and you know, like you were saying, serving, 800 people at Noodle. I mean, everything happens in a different way than you expect it to. So, right. Are there restaurants? I'm going to ask each of you this: whose design you admire? I mean, outside your own. I'm just curious. I love a lot of restaurants. I think that uh, uh, off the top of my head, I think Kikunoi in Kyoto is just uh, like they considered a young restaurant. It's 400 years old. <laughs> um, and, you know, Murata-san, every room is different and uh, like different themes, but it doesn't, it's not a theme. Everything is still more than Aikaiseki Japanese thing. And each room is like $6 million of renovations. And, you know, Murata-san was basically saying like this restaurant's been around for 400 years and we renovated so it would be around another 400 years. And I was like, he can only say that, <laughs> you know, that's a joke, <laughs> uh, but it's true. And when you see something that timeless, um, it's really, really beautiful. And I, I think that probably one of my favorite dining experiences, not just because of the food, uh, was actually El Bouilly. Mm -hmm. Because um, I don't know if people, it was cool that they opened up in the, in the fall and sort of winter, but, you know, I don't know how many restaurants where if you're rich enough, you can, you know, park your boat outside and, <laughs> and go out. But with all the food, it was still a Catalan home. And you, you never miss that experience. You could have your canapes and drinks outside watching the sunset on, in this beautiful forest in the beach overlooking all the water. And then you go inside and you, if you, you didn't look at the food, you're thinking you're in a grandmother's home. And then you go into the kitchen and you're like, well, this is the nicest kitchen I've ever seen. It's, right. you know, from the, the future. I have no idea what's going on. And, um, and that Every, wasn't a surprise when you got there and saw it was a little home. Such a surprise. Right? And a restaurant that actually like sort of makes me weep when I think about it is the Fat Duck mm -hmm. because it's a story of, um, of just making it happen. And if you really look, uh, if you go to the, I mean, Heston's amazing. But when he opened up that restaurant to this day, for a three Michelin star restaurant, when it first had three Michelin stars, it only had one fork and knife. It was that means it's like the least comfortable restaurant ever. Um, <laughs> for you to clean the carpets and take the the trash outside to this day, you have to roll it out the front and you have to roll out the carpets and it's it's a pain in the ass. Yeah, tall waiter has to duck tall under waiter. the under yeah. the beams. And they did it, it. The kitchen, you think it's this magnificent thing? No, it's this. 17 people all stuck like this and it's really uncomfortable but what you see is them trying whatever they can to make the space happen and uh, the fat duck synonymous with innovation and you're like how could this place be a place of innovation at all and then I'd always heard that they had cooked in a place like a like a like a, a sh uh, like a tool shed and I thought it was a tool shed like in America and then when I saw the tool sheds I was like that's not a tool shed it's like a like an outhouse and there's literally, if you walk to the, the outhouse, it was the first restaurant that I think Three Mission Stars where it literally was an outhouse. To get to the bathroom, you had to go outside. And when you see that, you're just like, my God, they really did whatever they could to make it happen. And then you see the tool sheds, and you can see they built one like every year. And every in each tool shed, there's a intercom. So there'd be like nine guys in nine tool sheds cooking like this. And communicating with the intercom it's the most insane situation but when you look at it you're like oh my god now that you see it they have this state-of-the-art you know this beautiful multi-million dollar lab and you can see sort of the humble beginnings of it so whenever i see a restaurant where you can see that growth to me that's something that is always inspiring drew do you have a favorite from design perspective or sitting in the dining room 
I mean, I, I've got a bunch of favorite restaurants, too. I, I think that the thing that I really appreciate about restaurant design is is the it's kind of like the attention to detail, the the extent to which the whoever's responsible for the design has gone through with a concept. So, um, I mean, you look places like some of McNally's places, like Balthazar. I mean, I think that and I could be wrong about this, but I think the last time I was there, I noticed that the emergency exit signs had been distressed to look like they were old and from France. Uh, and uh, like, if you're if you're if you're going to take that much time to think about you know, taking a little blotter of yellow paint and making your emergency floodlights that are, you know, FDNY regulated fixtures mm -hmm. look a little bit old, then and, and that's pretty interesting. There, there's a story about, you know, that the, the Department of Health and Department of Everything in New York requires us to put all kinds of signage around the restaurants, and some of those signs aren't necessarily all that attractive. Um, but I heard the story that at, at Schiller's, when they first opened, instead of putting the signs up like the choking sign or like the can't serve alcohol to pregnant women sign they put them on the that's bus the in the t-shirts yeah. and the bus boys and i was like oh. no that's a that's a true story yeah i but thought it was the coolest thing i did but i think it's interesting you mentioned balthazar because i was just at the balthazar in london and i agree with you the one in new york has this amazing reproduction quality you can't believe what they did but i have to say walking into the same thing in london was upsetting to me because there <laughs> suddenly it was I mean you thought that the washroom was going to be where it was in New York but it wasn't there was a mirror and people practically walked into that mirror because you were so used everything else looks so similar except the structure and so there I mean that could have happened you could have built an exact replica and were of noodle bar and of all these sorts of things which is what McNally basically did in London it's an identical replica of the restaurant except for that staircase um, and yet you didn't so you sort of made an, a new authentic experience of similar to the well that's the thing with the design in toronto i mean that was what was so great about working with anwar is that he did spend an awful lot of time down here in new york and spent an awful lot of time with us kind of trying to understand what we were what we wanted to accomplish and what we were about and then took our designs and sort of spun them up into something that was a lot more sophisticated and a lot more interesting than the stuff we'd come up with well, it was an evolution i think but you i mean you hit on the point that to me is important about restaurant design and, and that to me is authenticity um, because I think there's a lot of design now we can recreate everything so restaurants like you mentioned Balthazar in London I think one of my favorite like the Wolseley in London is like to me that's you know these grand spaces that to me are authentic right. and which everyone called the Balthazar of London until exactly. they opened a Balthazar in London exactly right right so and even in like my dad taking me to La Coupole in Paris and just like we would think that that room is designed, but that was just, you know, grand restaurant Parisian style that just functioned really well and, you know, could serve 300 people at the same time. It was, but it's so authentic. Like their exit signs probably are tarnished for real, right? So yeah, it's like, yeah. it's, and even more currently, like going to Noma, like I love the way design relates to the geography. To me, that's important. Like going into Noma, um, it, to me, it, like, the, I, it's not that I love a certain style of restaurant design, but to me that feels authentic to to the area, to the geography, to the food that it's creating. And, and I think in, in, its, in its own way, you lose track of that in places like Toronto and New York because they're so multicultural. We create different spaces and environments. Like there's, there's not one design that you can, you know, if I think about New York, maybe I would say Odeon is like to me like something that I remember is like a classic New York place that I, you know, used to go to, but New York is so many different things. So it's, you know, what is, what is a New York designed restaurant? There's, and yet, you know, famous New York chef comes to Toronto. What is, what is the authentic design, the authentic experience there? I, I'm cert, I mean, as someone who grew up in Toronto and lives my life in New York, there's this huge fascination with everything that happens in New York from Toronto's perspective. Absolutely. Until, of course, someone comes in and does something really great, and then they think, oh, well, we could have done that. Or, I don't know. I mean, not, it's not all that. Or, I mean, how do you, did you, did you take that? Was that in your mind? What, no, not really. I mean, this, I, I think they kind of owned that language or that style or those design movements. Like, we didn't really reinvent the wheel. Like, we... You know, there's a little bit of 
things or stuff from everywhere. It's it's probably most like Ma Pesh, but even Drew and I were talking about the the wood slat wall. Like we've, it's been an evolution of like plywood to like a little bit nicer slat wall to now in Toronto we've got like backlighting and mirror. Right. And so, you totally recognize it when you walk in. I have to say it it re, re, it's reminiscent of that plywood wall right? like a lot cooler yeah, right? yeah. yeah. It, well it looks like you had a lot more money <laughs> yeah a little bit more yeah it was, it's beautiful it's I subtle think. yeah it's Anwar beautiful. did an amazing job of literally making three distinct four distinct spaces but i mean i still don't know how to appreciate it because i i just don't know i, I really maybe like 10 years from now i'll be like oh man like while i'm very appreciative and it's beautiful i i still have this weird idea that just give me a concrete box. <laughs> Let's just make food in that. Because <laughs> I feel that the nicer a room looks, you almost have to not work harder. It just diminishes the food. Uh, interesting. Diminishes the food or, or forces you to elevate the food? I think it's a... I love the juxtaposition of ha having... Um, my, my dream for a while, thankfully Danny did it, was to have total hole, like literally a hole in the wall restaurant. Danny Bowen, you mean? Yeah, at Mission. I'll just pull a Danny out of the air and, uh, <laughs> with a hole in the wall, yeah. And not get crappy food, but to get the best food. And that was sort of the idea with Sambar, because it's not supposed to look like a fast food restaurant. How do you have a fast food restaurant that doesn't look like a fast food restaurant, not serve fast food, but doing fast food? And, um, you know, if you go to Le Bernardin, which is such a beautiful restaurant, I think in New York, that's like my favorite dining room right now, because it's funny, I'm, I'm talking about all these super fancy places, but um, I think the redesign that Ben Tell and Ben Tell did is just tremendous, because you can't, you know, that's such an iconic dining room, and it looks sexy now, like everybody looks better. It's like one of those restaurants where like, no matter what you do, you just look better. <laughs> um, and the food looks better. It just looks right. And it's such a hard thing to do. But for, for me, I'm just still stuck in this juvenile notion that, like, give me the worst looking room and I can serve you food that will that you're not going to expect. But it's funny that you said that at Le Bernadette everyone looks better because I think at Sambar everyone looks cooler. <laughs> like you walk in there and you just feel cooler because of the environment, which is, I mean, as much a part of the experience as anything. Right. <laughs> it's, that's it's that's one yep. of the one of it's one of the one of my absolute the, the best parts of my job is when you've got Dave on one side who says just give me a blank box don't worry about the design where everything and I I literally say this I'm not yeah, it's, it's not hyperbole I was like give like, me a blank box I just, don't care he's like he's like forget about the bathrooms you go to Fat Duck you have to go outside to go to the bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, one hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars the first one. Why are you spending? Blah, 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 blah. And then I got Anwar on the other side, who's like, you know, and I have to say to him, I'm sorry, but we just want to, we want like a blank box, please, um, and the no no bathroom. <laughs> and and he Anwar's like, what? But then while well, you do it, you know. <laughs> so so I can't say. You know, I mean, I had this amazing resource in Anwar, and then I have Dave on the other side saying, it's about the food, it's about the food. I have to somehow try to make both of them kind of happy, so. Well, I, I think that was the goal, though, right? Was not to, I don't think now with the Bill product, I don't think we overshadowed anything. I mean, I think it's very functional. There's a lot of, like, design cues and elements from New York. Uh, I think you could have easily over-designed that space just by the way that it's so grand in it in it in itself um and, and that was always the mandate i mean i was at sam sambar last night and it, it really is more than just the design i mean it is the people like you said it's the lighting it's the music you know and in momofuku toronto i mean i've been there um early in the morning with a photographer when the space is totally empty and it feels it's got a certain feel to it when you're shooting it and then go back later that night and there's you know what over 50 staff 300 people on all the floors the music's blaring like it's just a great to me that's the completion of the design um when you see it sort of in that. action yeah but that that's to me like for me when i think about restaurant design i don't think about restaurant design as in like how does you know how do the people that created it perceive it i think that like when you go to a samba or noodle bar like yes we play a lot of music but music became part of the only thing that we could create and control, and that was part of the design. Mm -hmm. um, so you might not have heard, like, whatever, I don't know, any band that you might not have ever thought would be played at a restaurant, and we're playing it, and playing it loud, and there were reasons why we were playing it loud, which we're playing it lower now, but... Um, 
I think that it, the best analogy I can give is like when you go to a sporting event and the crowd's in it. And you're like, wow, this is so lively. This is exciting. And everyone's jumping. And you're like, okay, I get it. Like the crowd, home crowd advantage. And I feel that for me, that's the, what's not artificial is if you can get the entire room and they're not, they're not commenting, oh, I love that flower arrangement and <laughs> that painting's beautiful and I can't <laughs> believe the wait staff and their clothes and this is such a wonderful, beautiful dining experience. If they're buzzed because of the food, then who cares about the rest of the stuff? And when you have all those tables, it's like doing a wave, like everybody, and it just becomes this sort of this thing that continues and then that energy and that buzz sort of connects to an open kitchen and then I don't, to me, I don't, I'm not looking at anything else. I'm looking at what the customer wants and they can complain all they want about after the fact, but I think during the time, I'm hoping they're having a great time enjoying it. I think it's, that's a perfect place to, to stop. It, it, I, I, think, I think we'll stop there with everybody enjoying it and let's have a round of applause for our <laughs> panelists. And now I open the floor to questions for you. I'm sure some of the things you heard or have experienced have, yes. Okay, so, hey, my name is Paul. Okay, if you can just wait for a mic, please, one sec. <laughs> there may not be any rules in a Hello. David Chang restaurant, but here there are. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Paul. I'm actually a Eugene Lang alumni. Um, I actually just got back to New York. I started a restaurant called Sticky's Finger Joint. It's a chicken finger restaurant. I started with $70,000. We have no bathroom. Uh, we have no bathroom because we realized it would cost more money to hire another person. And we kind of look at design uh, based off, does it make sense, like literally on a financial level? And I think we screwed up doing that. And kind of looking at our space right now, literally just concrete, we sp literally spent nothing. Out of that 75, it was like 25 went to the back. But how do you guys, I guess more so like, all these new places, of course you have all the money coming from developers. Uh, you have a lot, it's just, it's fun, it's exciting. But how do you really psychologically think about the customer? Like what's the experience of the customer in the store? Because right now, especially in New York, I mean, what I've, I've realized also is this, New York's a place where people love to sit, they love to feel like they're the theater of it. So you said screw the flowers, let me have the theater, this open kitchen. And I think that experience in itself, but my I guess the ultimate question here to you is what is the psycho, like, the actual, like, do you look at it psychologically speaking, like when a person actually enters into the restaurant, what's the experience they're gonna have? And do you look at that through the lens of the monetary, where it's like, how do you create that experience that, I guess, the fulcrum of innovation? You meet a customer's desires, needs, wants at the lowest possible complexity or price point. But, I mean, do you do that kind of going to every single store? And if you do do that, how do you do it? Thank you. That's a really <laughs> loaded question. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know. Um, <laughs> True? You know, you know, I don't really know. No, but it, we never had a budget. You know, we've always done our own. All until we've done Sydney and Toronto, all the projects are our own money. Um, so there is a certain desperation to make ends meet. No, no, more than that, like when you walk into your store, so it's like if you could have some grand, amazing, beautiful thing there, or do you think of the experience? Is it every single step of the way? No, we're we're thinking. Of, I mean, it we. He tells me to think about the food, and it's it is it's like the, it's food it's all food focused for us, right? So if you look at the, if you go to Sambar now, you know the the silverware you get is. I mean I don't know I've seen better uh, silverware I mean, in the middle the, school cafeteria, but the the the, <laughs> the 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 place is just a it's a it's a it's a black box. If you ask most people what their greatest food memory is or what makes them really happy. All right, let's just, for example, we all go to Baja, California, or Mexico, when we're eating fish tacos on the beach. Are you worried about the decor? Of course not. It's not awesome food. Yeah. And so, or if you're eating amazing fried chicken in Low Country, or you're eating, you know, grilled oysters in Charleston, like, who cares if it's in a shack, right? Some of the best meals I've ever had are in hutongs, like, literally, like, crappy little ghetto-like homes that have been destroyed in Beijing because it's just about the food. It doesn't matter about anything like that. So if you take that and put it into another environment, I don't know what the big deal is in terms of trying to put all your, you know, at the end of the day, you're a restaurant. You're not a gallery. You're serving food. And I think that you need to deliver on that, number first and foremost. Okay. Other questions? Yes, please. Microphone, please. 
All right. We'll be no, next. No, there's some. So. I, I worked for Paul Perdome for three years mm -hmm. in New York, Fun. hey Paul's New York, and that was his idea, to have an empty blank kind of restaurant, and the only thing on the wall was down where Best Buy is now on Broadway in Houston, and uh, Arc Restaurants were the partner for him. He had a mural of himself in front of the New Orleans <coughs> restaurant. That was it. No tablecloths, nothing. We, I was a waitress, we bust the tables. He wanted everybody there for the food. Yeah. And that was kind of what you were saying. Uh -huh. there were, we had Cajun music playing in Zydeco, but that was it. Hmm. Oh. Here, please. I'm sorry, maybe I missed this, but why did you open in Toronto of all the places you could? Well, <laughs> that's funny thing is everyone's like, have you been to, have you been to Toronto? I'm asking seriously. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> town. I mean, I don't know why everyone's like, I can understand why can Canadian, particularly people from Toronto have this chip on your shoulder, like sort of fuck you, like why you're asking, I'm not saying that to you, ma'am. I'm just saying like, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's like, why not Toronto? I mean, that's the question I have. It's like, why doesn't Toronto deserve it? Why should Chicago get a restaurant? You know, if we opened up Chicago with people saying, why'd you choose Chicago? Interesting. You know, it's just, it's still North America. It's, close, fact, it's closer it's, than Sydney. It's a larger city than Chicago. And it's more diverse. Uh, the economy is doing a lot better in Canada. They're, they're giving us carte blanche to do whatever we want. I mean, I don't, if someone can point me to an opportunity and a place where it's as open and free and they're hungry for new, then by all means, show me, but I don't know where. So the question I ask is, why not? Why not, if I open up in Phoenix, you'd be like, why Phoenix, Arizona? I mean, we've had a, we're very lucky to have opportunities to open up all over the place, but until you guys spend time in another city, it's like, okay, you know, it's like, if we open up Montreal, people are like, oh, Montreal has a food culture, we get it, but I mean, Toronto, it's just new, like, it's so different, and it's possible, so anything seems possible, so when I'm there, and I'm working with the cooks, they want to be part of this, this new growing culture, so... That's the way we, we're looking at it. We want to invest in an environment and community that's on its way up, mm -hmm. not, not static. We spend a lot of time there before. <laughs> the Toronto is clapping, right? Did you spend time there before? Some time, not, not a whole lot of time, but the past year I spent a tremendous amount of time up there. We took a long time thinking about whether or not we were going to do this project. So the, the, the amount of time that we spent trying to sort out the, the, the agreement, the, you know, we made a, a lot of trips up there and really sat with a bunch of different chefs from Toronto and 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 felt it out before we decided to make the move. I mean, um, we, opened up, we opened up in Sydney and people were like, why'd you open in Sydney? I was like, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I it's it. awesome there. Well, what's wrong with that? And, and that was the challenge for us. It's like, can we deliver? Can we... Our goal isn't to open up restaurants just for the sake of opening it up. It creates an opportunity for someone like Sam Gelman, who's here today, to to showcase his skills and his, his ability to lead. Uh, we have Mitch Bates, who's here. People don't necessarily want to live in New York. That's what I've learned. It's not the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. I believe that. And it's true. Like, people want to not, like, if you're a cook in your 30s, it's really hard to raise a family here. Why would you want to stay here? I don't blame them. And... Um, Sydney's an awesome place, and if we're going to grow and it matches with what we can do for our, our cooks and employees and our farmhouse managers, and it's an opportunity where we can open up a great restaurant, we're not just planting our flag for the sake of planting our flag, but if we can do something that's awesome, then we're going to do that, and we're going to try to do it great. And Sydney, our goal was, can we put our flag, what I've, not, it's not our flagship restaurant, but can we open up a flagship restaurant on the other side of the planet? And that was our challenge to ourselves. And it looked really close on a map. <laughs> if you haven't understood and, Dave and his team like a challenge. Or and least Toronto was like, everyone's like, oh, at least in my head, I guess I'm making, I'm paranoid. But people are like, well, you can't open up a big restaurant. I was like, okay, we're going to open up a fucking really big restaurant. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Uh, microphone, please. Um, 
Can I just ask where on, it seems that you just talking, David, you're talking about caring about the food so much. I'm wondering where kind of food trucks fit in this and do that, does that solve your just all food and like that's what should matter or is that almost too far on the extreme of kind of full experience design restaurants all the way to just really good food? Um, while I like eating out of food trucks, I don't want to cook in a food truck. And I just need still a kitchen. And I, I, I mean, I can't, I can't do it. No. It's very hard, actually. It's really hard. And cooking's already difficult. I don't need it to be more difficult. Yes, question? Um, it seems as if um, my thought is that David probably started cooking by himself, but the two of you, Andrew and David, seem to be so complimentary, just in speaking tonight, you know, and then, you know, you really are in the middle between these two. <laughs> um, I'm just interested in how you found each other and, and at what point. Friendster? Yeah. Friendster. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, Friendster, Friendster MySpace. Um, <laughs> I, think I had a, I had an AOL account. Yeah. <laughs> we had a mutual mutual friend. Um, we had a we had a, we had no, a bar. Yeah. I had a I was working at a bar across the street from Noodle Bar, and I don't know if, how many people know this outside of the industry, but cooks like to have beer after work, <laughs> and bartenders like to eat usually before work because they get too busy, and so they created a relationship, and then we had this mutual friendship, and and who knew Koreans and. German culture was so similar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, both of our parents think that, you know, the absence of criticism is praise. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a neurotic so, uh, complementarity there. Yeah. So good. Yes. Anwar, as the designer working with a bunch of different chefs, do you feel like sometimes you're just the translator of getting their ideas? Or do you try to get some consistent common themes in the different restaurants you design? Well, I mean, the chefs, I mean, there, there's a man, everybody sort of has a different mandate, right? Like we, we try and accommodate front of house, back of house, we, you know, to answer the first question. I mean, we do think about the experience and everything you, you you know, from the minute you open the front door to where you're going to go, the ergonomics of everything. Um, you know, this, I mean, this was really, uh, like you said, I mean, Drew was really the in-between because, the, you know, Dave was focusing on, on the food and the team and, and the chefs, and we were just trying to make sure that this, you know, kind of monster could actually operate and, and run. So, you know, it's, it's, you try and balance everything. And I think good design is about balance and about, um, you know, accommodating a bunch of different things and, 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 you know, giving and taking. Um, but again, it's, it, it wasn't, again, it wasn't about over design or anything. It was, it was more about functionality and making people feel that there was some common connection between Toronto and New York and, you know, the Momofuku there and here. And, um, I think that was really, you know, I kind of left the chefs to do their thing once we had carved out the spaces that they had needed. Um, so it didn't really, you know, affect my work too much. And I don't mean to minimalize it, Anwar's contribution to this. I mean, he, it, he it's clearly his design. There were clearly his ideas that we have a bunch of crazy rules. We only allow one piece of art in, in the restaurant. Well, that's Dave's rule. And, uh, and so we only had to have one piece of art. And he like was able to totally roll with the punches on that. When the private dining room on the second floor didn't work out at all, and we were just what we thought weeks away from opening, and had to completely change up what we were going to do, and I were sitting around thinking, you know, if we're not careful, this is going to turn out to be like an airport lounge. And then we thought, well, what if it was a really cool airport lounge? <laughs> And what if we got like these like, really old vintage like chairs, but like they were all different so that no one could say it was a cookie cutter airport lounge, but it were all different stuff. And Anwar was like, all right, let's get in the car. And so we, he and I went driving around like two little old ladies in the Berkshires <laughs> looking for antiques. <laughs> In, and, in the G-Wagon. It's really yeah. cool. That's so and, funny. And we, and we, and we like literally would, would go into an antique store, find uh, like an amazing chair, throw it in the back put of his the truck, and, and drive it back over to the space and put it in there and then figure out, okay, we can get four more in. 
And so he, I mean, like, without, without it being overbearing, completely took all of our kind of crazy rules and made them work, which is amazing. And also just his experience in the restaurant business made it so that, like, when we were talking about the conversation about the, you know, the, the customer's experience when they walk in and where are the bathrooms and how do things go, because he had worked in a restaurant, because his family had operated a restaurant, it was such an easy conversation. It made everything, it made such a huge, huge difference. The, uh, far and away the most, the, most, the most satisfying experience I've had with building a restaurant. Uh, over time. Uh, yeah. Restaurant art is really weird and arbitrary. Because <laughs> it, 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 um, if, it's, if it's not a picture of food, people think it's weird. But you don't go to a bank and see pictures of money, and you don't, you know, you don't, you know, it's just like, just ridiculous that it has to be pictures of food. I just think it's stupid, so. You want to talk about And, you, and you, you snuck some pieces in there, though, I saw. Didn't you go up to Chinatown, and I, there's like a, it was a, a tiger up there now, and there's, you, you just, every time you show up, something pokes its head. Uh, oh. Yeah, well, he can make the rules, so he can also break yeah, the rules. Yeah, so. exactly. But do you want to talk about the one piece of art that we have in there? Oh, the Neil Young? Yeah. That's a great piece. The, so we have this, Dave and I, I don't know, we share a lot of interesting, like, sort of common background, but the, the, there's an, uh, an artist, called, his name's Steve Keen, who's famous for doing album covers, but painting them very quickly. I went to school in Virginia, and, and Steve lived in the town uh, the same time that I was there, and he would paint these things on the street in, like, two minutes, and then just give them away. His idea was to sort of give, give art away. And so when we were fitting out Ma Pesh, Dave, who was also a fan, uh, called him up and said, would you give us a, a couple paintings that we can put in Ma Pesh? And I think he came up with like two or three hundred. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was a, like stacks and stacks and stacks of paintings, and we just started putting them all over the walls, and then we thought maybe we should just let people take them if they want. We didn't, I mean, we had so many, we didn't know what to do with them. So when it kind of came time to do the Toronto concept, I called him up and he said, come down to the, to the, to my studio. And I said, we've got this huge wall, and it's, it, you know, it's like, it's like 20 feet tall and 40 feet wide, and we don't know what to do with it. And do you have any ideas? And I thought, Dave said he wanted it to be have something to do with Neil Young. Well, every I wanted every floor to be a different age of Neil Young. <laughs> <laughs> so that a whole progression. Yeah, of progression like... <laughs> of age. And so, so that'll so, be our music and so signing Steve, series. But we'll get back to that. Steve goes. <laughs> Steve goes. Well. I, and I thought, you know, Neil Young, album cover, Steve Keen, like, we, okay, this makes, this makes perfect sense. And he says, well, actually, I don't want to just do that. Instead, I'm thinking, like, have you ever seen, like, those 16th century, like, battle tapestries? Where they're, like, and he's, and he's opening up these books, and he's showing me these pictures, and he's, there's this one battle tapestry where Achilles is dragging a headless guy across the bottom of, the, of, the, of this beautiful tapestry. And he said... What if we do the same thing, like a battlefield tapestry, but I'll do it out of plywood, and we'll make it like a Neil Young concert? And at I Madison had, Square Gardens, I had no, and I was like, I and I and again, just n no idea. It's so crazy that we had to say yes. But I was like, I, I, I was like, you, I, I, whatever you, whatever you think, man, that's that's cool. And he, and he <laughs> so he did it, and then he called me back, and he's like, okay, and it's it's big. Uh, and uh, we were really struggling with how we were going to get it to Toronto, but he, when he showed it to me, he put it all together. It's this scene from Madison Square Garden, and if you if you really look at it and the old battlefield tapestries, it completely makes sense. But, but only, only to us. I think one more question, and then we'll so it's a pretty good transition. So beyond structural design and thinking about music as design in terms of what it adds to an environment. You know, you mentioned something like Mission Chinese, I just moved from San Francisco, and something like that, I love eating in that shitty environment. It makes things, things taste better. But for example, if they have Green Day on Pandora versus, you know, Wu-Tang Clan, it totally affects the taste of the food, to me personally. You know, I know you've talked about the role of music and food, but you know, thinking about these restaurants, thinking about Sydney, demographically Sydney is a very different restaurant to Noodle Bar. How do you approach music in each of the environments? Um, it's actually the same playlist at all the restaurants. 
<laughs> I've just gotten too lazy. It's too it's too much work. Um, and I don't I have no idea what's going on in terms of music right now. I think it's a side of me getting older because I just don't care anymore about there's two new bands. I was like, I don't care. It what's new now will be new in ten years from now. So if it's good enough now, it'll be good enough to listen to in ten years. And that's sort of the way I look at it because. Um, I mean, I've really spent a lot of time on the music, and I've really come to the conclusion there's only 5,000 songs out of the entire world of music, hist- universe of music that you can play in a restaurant. Um, you can't play classical music. You can't play jazz. You can play some jazz, but most people only know Miles Davis, you know, Time Out, and, um, you know, Kind of Blue, Time Out, and, like, you know, some other bad, I mean, not bad, but like, <laughs> you can't play it, and you can't play classical music, and it's just, that is, like, wor- the worst going to a restaurant and eating to classical music. Um, or gypsy gangs. <laughs> and, 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 and like, I think that it has to be like ambient music. So a lot of, I think just, you know, bands like the Velvet Underground or Luna or Pavement, ba- Pavement or whatever, where they're still musicians, there's still craftsmanship, you can listen to it, but it's not known to people, to most people. It becomes great ambient music. And um, so, I also found that if you're playing a band that most people never get to hear, but you like a lot, then they're going to love the food that much more. They're like, oh, I'm listening to a band that I love. I think everyone hates. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and you can't, I've, but you can probably play Green Day in 30 years. <laughs> That's the truth. I, I think that there's like a 20, 30 year window where pop songs from America become totally okay to play. Like, in the, right now, I think we can play a lot of hair metal rock ballads, which we're doing, for instance, like, Sticks Come Sail Away, to me, is an amazing song. <laughs> and it probably was too ironic to play in the 90s, but now it's hilarious, <laughs> just plain funny. You know, or you listen to, like, all of these, like, terrible bands trying to sing a romantic love song. It's awesome. And it, it's, <laughs> it's something that we try to encourage. Um, so that's why. So we try to give it a like a like a window where there's some exceptions, but to the rule that there's only like a you have to pass like a 25 year mark if you're trying to play an ironic song. Anyway. Okay. And on that note about dining and yeah, disco, uh, we will <laughs> a round of applause, please, for everybody again. I want to remind. So Dave is actually going to be signing the Mama Fuku cookbook if you want to purchase one and have him sign it right over there. And uh, we'll be able to see the video of this and yep. tell your friends the interesting conversation you witnessed. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the video will be available on the Inquisitive Eater. It usually takes us one week to edit it and put it on. So you're more than welcome to see the website. And as I said, if you want to submit, please do. We're, we're really excited to get external submissions. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you to our uh, speakers. It was a great panel. And uh, if you're interested in future events, just leave your name outside, and we'll send you all the announcements. Thank you. Thank you.